Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's first episode of Details, brought to you by Stardust Life Center Design. My name is Giselle Carr. I'm the founder of Stardust. And joining me today, we have two incredible creative professionals, incredibly inspiring, Nadia Huggins and Yutaka Takira. Thank you so much for joining us today. And today we're gonna to be talking about the topic of the responsibility of designing resilience. It's a huge topic really, but we're gonna hone in on the response of creative professionals around the world and leaders in terms of natural disasters and how we can really plot a way forward for a thriving future for those who experience them. So I'd first like to invite Nadia and Yutaka to please introduce yourselves to our audience. So start with Nadia. Sure, thank you so much, Giselle. It's really cool to be here doing this with you. I've known you for some time and it's just nice to be able to talk about these things in this capacity. Um, but I'm Nadia Huggins, I'm a visual artist. I'm uh, based in St. Vincent and Grenadines. I've been born, I, I was born, I grew up, I've worked in the Caribbean my entire life. So I guess you can say like an island girl in every sense. Um, my focus is in the visual arts. I work primarily in photography and my work focuses on documenting landscapes and seascapes. Um, and, you know, like a lot of the themes I kind of deal with is belonging and memory. Um, and well, quite recently, incidentally, the environment. Um, so, you know, this, this is kind of like a trajectory I've been on now with my work. Um, and I mean, I just kind of like a side note, like I've just recently gone through a volcanic eruption in some instant grenadine. So, that's really kind of been a very pivotal moment in the type of work I've been doing. Um, and hopefully we can get into that a bit more through the discussion. What's mm -hmm. yeah. it, Yutaka? Hey, uh, my name is Yutaka Takiura Yutaka. I'm an architect uh, based in New York City, New York, uh, US. And uh, I, uh, um, I'm doing more interior uh, architecture in general as a practice. And uh, I've been teaching at uh, several schools, including Pratt Institute. Um, I currently teaching a design management program, which is a business school. <laughs> and uh, um, um, a, about uh, a, a recovery effort or risk management effort. I, um, I've been involved in uh, one time I was on board of Architecture for Humanity, or, uh, where we try to help uh, uh, provide design services for uh, the community in need of help, especially after disasters. Also, currently, um, I'm a member of uh, a Unified uh, Risk Task Force at uh, a, a, a AIA New York, New York State and New York as well as a, 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 a committee, uh, it's, a, it's a long one, a committee for a, a des, a, a design for risk and reconstruction. So that's my involvement. Awesome. awesome. Yeah, I mean, we were just saying before, it feels kind of full circle almost, because I see you with the Pratt logo there. And, uh, you know, a side note is that I met Yutaka because he was my professor at Pratt at design management. And uh, one of the most unforgettable projects I ever got to work on, which was reimagining a Japanese town after the triple disaster in 2011. So it's very, very exciting to have both of you here and to be able to talk about this with you today. Great. Okay, so Thank just you. dive Thank right you. in. So just to start off, could you guys describe some of the experiences you've had with regard to natural and man-made disasters, what it's like to experience them, witness them, and document them, and just what that's been like for you as a human being as well and as a creative? Sure. I mean, I, I guess I can start um, more specifically with the volcanic eruption that we, uh, the country and some of the just went through in uh, April um, on the 9th. Um, it's my first experience with a natural disaster of that scale. Um, I, I suppose, I mean, for me as a creative being thrown into a situation like that, my, my kind of baseline survival mechanism is to always like re resort to like being creative in a situation to cope, which was very interesting to actually realize like happening as this thing was unfolding. Cause like a lot of people are asking me like, you know, like how could you, find you know the strength in you to document something while this is going on 
But for me, I think it was just sort of like that, like I said, like that kind of baseline response that I've been kind of taught to, to like handle a situation. Um, and I, you know, in the moments I sort of realized that there was a real value and importance to capture these things as it was happening because, you know, I had done a lot of work prior, you know, um, curating like a photography exhibition on previous eruptions. Um, and I, you know, just from engaging with those images, I realized the importance of people having access to that and really get getting a deeper understanding of what happens during an eruption. And I noticed there were gaps in, in a lot of the images or like the collection of images that were um, created during those times. Um, and I wanted to be able to figure out ways to fill the gaps and, in, in, you know, in what wasn't there. So, um, you know, I tried to focus a bit more on the personal experience of what was happening during the eruption for me. Um, so like a lot of my images, you know, I'm not looking at like people in shelters or like that kind of like panic and like that disaster porn, as you might put it, but uh, trying to like sort of think about it from like my own kind of experience going through it, even though I wasn't necessarily in one of the more vulnerable areas. Like I was still very much affected within within the area that I was living in. Um, and I think it's important for people to understand that there's like a variety of experiences that happen during a natural disaster. So, I mean, beyond the obvious adrenaline and terror and depression and everything like, that you go through um, in that spectrum of emotions, um, I think for me, I just fundamentally understood that there was uh, an importance in what you know, my kind of skill set was and how, how I could have utilized that in some way to, you know, help future generations understand what it is they'll be dealing with eventually. Yeah, yeah, it's tremendous. I mean, the thing that moved me the most in terms of some of your recent interviews, there was a quote about you looking back at the island and realizing that that was how islands are created. Yeah. Which I, I just, I felt it in my body when I read it. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I, I think, you know, we, we, it's a very abstract idea in some ways, but I mean, I think it's really important for us to understand the geology of a place as well and like how that formation, not just islands, I mean, the world in general, like how, what, what our relationship is like with the sea, what our relationship is like with the land and how we actually engage with these spaces. Um, I think, I think it's helpful to, you know, get like a very, you know, bird's eye view on things. So, that will kind of help us figure out ways to like navigate these contours of like where we're living, you know. Hand over to you, Taka. Yeah. Maybe you could describe some mm. of your experiences because you've had a mm. wide range mm. of perspectives too. Yeah, personal experience was um, in 1995. Um, I was in New York, uh, but uh, uh, Kobe, Japan got hit by pretty big heart earthquake and about 6,000 6, people died. It's uh, 1995, it's a modern times. It's not uh, ancient and technology, everything. And, but uh, still um, one earthquake uh, got uh, 6,000 people. That was shocking. And I couldn't uh, connect to my mother and people there that moment. It was really scary. Um, even though I was not there, just because I couldn't uh, get enough information about what happened there, um, and even TV shows, some images, but uh, it's uh, I didn't know what happened. So it was the first ex more like personal experience. Other than that, um, I, I, I of course in twenty. Uh, uh, 20, uh, 2011, the, uh, as uh, mentioned, um, a, a northern Japan earthquake and tsunami and the Fukushima, all those um, things, when it happened, uh, it, of course I couldn't believe it and uh, tried to, uh, uh, I was a, a already in the uh, architecture of humanity and we try to help. On the other hand, um, what to do, we didn't know. And it's um, talking about 6,000 miles away from New York. And uh, what, uh, where to start? That was a question um, as an architect. Uh, well, uh, can we go there? But well, go there and what? Um, and uh, get the food from people in need of food. It's weird. So 
we didn't know what to do. And then personally, Sandy uh, hit the New York uh, not long ago, it's, but it's already more eight, nine years ago. That was uh, another tremendous disaster in uh, the city of New York. Um, personally, we didn't have water, uh, uh, electricity for seven days, I guess. It was tough uh, in modern New York City. Um, and uh, of course, we didn't have a cell, cell, cell phone signal. So we are totally out of, um, how to say, a, a power and uh, uh, connection to or information, everything. So it was um, my personal experience. And of course, I saw many uh, Haiti and others. And still, it happened two weeks ago, I think. Oh, last week or two weeks ago, and uh, yes. uh, it happens yeah. everywhere. But the uh, difference for, of Haiti was uh, this time people didn't pay attention like last time, unfortunately. Mm. It seems like uh, uh, they didn't get enough funding this time, unfortunately. So um, my experience, we will talk more, but uh, how, where to start and how to raise a fund. And even, uh, uh, it's, it's a great idea to help uh, people in need. On the other hand, so where to start and uh, how to do it. Uh, we have to always think about it. That's what I learned. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, you raise yeah, really. I... Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, I mean, especially with regards to the funding, I mean, it's always about, I guess, like trusting building trust on the ground with people who you know are going to do the right kind of work you know like you know like you said like there's immediate needs in a natural disaster food water mm -hmm. like shelter um but you know also thinking long term like how to help people um reconsider the ways in which they're you know maybe building their homes you know like getting mental health um help you know um figuring out like real substantial ways forward and mm -hmm. you know like you need you need trustworthy people in, in those positions to facilitate that, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also uh -huh. like this confluence of um, issues as well, like a confluence of crises. Cause remember everyone is already living with at least a year, a year and a half of COVID-19 and the strain yeah. that puts on them economically, mentally, as you said also, right? Um, financially, and then this happens. <clears throat> and so it's like, you have to deal with these multiple moving you know, targets all the time. And the frightening thing, at least, or the alarming thing I should say that I've been seeing is that, you know, we've been warned about climate change for so long. We've been warned about that there are gonna be more and more extreme events. So it's kind of looking at how, how are we gonna adapt? You know, how are we gonna create that resilience, that ability to adapt to these conditions? Because, it, you know, it doesn't seem to be lessening. You know, we'll probably have to deal with multiple crises at the same time in future. Mm. You know, the next 20, 30 years is probably going to be characterized by that. Yeah. So, yeah. So maybe we yeah, could... Think... Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, I mean, I think that, I mean, there's like a lot of value in that kind of like deep-rooted indigenous knowledge. You know, I mean, indigenous peoples have figured out ways to right. adapt to situation forever, you know, and I mean... They're like some very simple sort of like techniques and like fundamental ways of doing things. And we could learn a lot from them. Um, you know, it, it doesn't make sense always trying to like reinvent the wheel in certain situations. And of course we want to innovate things. Um, but I think we also need to figure out ways to work with people who've already been doing things in a particular way and like, you know, figured out how to adapt. I mean, for example, here during the eruption, you know, there's, you know, both sides of the island have had very different experiences. Like a lot of the economy actually depended on the marijuana farmers who were based around the volcano. Um, and they've been some of the most resilient people during this eruption within the north. You know, like they've been able to like move their crops and figure out new places to plant. And, you know, in terms of like agriculture, they are really the ones who've like figured out like how to survive after this thing, you know? So, I mean, and there's something like interesting there to kind of look at. It's like, you know, what, you know, what they're growing, like how they're supporting themselves, like where they're growing, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, that's just like in, in the sense of like agriculture, but um, 
you know, there's there's a lot of knowledge that's already within the, these communities that we can learn from other people, but it's just being open and receptive to that knowledge, you know. How, uh, Nadia, how do you uh, get uh, history um, information, like what happened before? Um, uh, yeah. uh, from generation to generation, how do you, I mean, like a, a, a grandfather, grandmother, they may remember some stories, uh, what happened in the past, maybe like 100 years ago, for example, do you have um, any? I mean, there's, again, like story, storytelling from, you know, uh, mm. different people, like you have, I, we, we have a sort of like a, um, what's the word, a kind of laziness to like creating a collective memory for people to access. So like we don't mm -hmm. have museums or like a proper record of things. Unfortunately, especially in the smaller islands, I mean, a lot of our content is either, you know, recorded, you know, by the British and it's like held in like the sort of archives. We don't really have access to it. So you really have to kind of go out there and get it to, mm -hmm. to have a kind of understanding of what happened during a certain time. But in terms of like a local knowledge, I mean, if you're inquisitive and you speak to the right people, they will tell you a story about, you know, when they were children and the stories that their grandparents might have told them. Um, there's no kind of physical record that you can like access when you go into these spaces to say like, oh, well, this would have happened here. I mean, besides the landscape that's changing and you can like see like obvious like cuts in the land or whatever or like the river that might have shifted in a way like unless you're like trained to understand what you're looking at um you just kind of have to go based on your, your own curiosity i suppose um and, and like asking people i mean what they might have experienced uh, and i think like part of what i would like to do is be able to create that record um for future generations like i said i mean whether it's through photography or like Mm -hmm. um video like recording these stories in some way um yeah so important it's so mm -hmm. important and to document the relationship with nature as well and the way that you have like it's very profound and i mean it's coming up more and more in some of the other things that you had mentioned previously things happening now with um you know the reef and so on a funny yeah. aside i remember um my mother actually, now that you talk about mentioned it, I remember my mother has a, a nursery rhyme about hurricane season. I, it's like a funny rhymey thing so that you remember the, day, the months. It's something like June too soon, July fly by, August mm. come it must, uh, September remember. So I guess it's mm. in remembrance of you mm. know, people who have gone before uh, October all over. Mm. But so it's a really interesting way to just be like, remember, oh, okay, hurricane season is coming, you know, but for whatever reason, the older people know that. I don't know how many people uh, yeah, yeah. know that. Yes, I, I don't think, I've never heard that, right? That's, that's pretty <laughs> interesting though. I, I think you talk, you had mentioned a story as well um, yes. about that kind of like, uh, that kind of primitive means of like documenting. Right. Yes, uh, it's... Uh... Uh, when I visited uh, Sendai area where no Northern uh, earthquake, uh, Northern Japan earthquake happened and hit uh, pretty hard. And uh, this Sendai uh, is one of the largest uh, hub city in that area and uh, very urban, very, like high rise buildings and so on. However, when I visited people um, uh, near the water, uh, a, a little bit more countryside, I'm talking about only 30 minutes away by car, and uh, um, people pointed out that uh, there is a, this song, uh, the generations they kept uh, singing, which is about uh, when some disaster happens, like uh, run up the hill, stay away from water, and don't look back and don't worry about other people because water comes too fast and so on. That, that's a song. And also uh, when uh, I visit there and also I did some research and uh, I saw uh, old, old, a, how do you call it, like a stone plate uh, with a, a, a script saying that uh, uh, if we wanna build a house, uh, uh, build beyond this point. 
for example, or uh, some uh, some other stone pieces, a a um, a a a, a you run this direction instead of that direction, and so on. And uh, uh, some certain time, a, 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 a water come up to here and so on. So those are uh, uh, talking about 100 years old, 200 years old, small pieces. So it's before digital age. So no uh, a, a, a cell signal or anything. But uh, uh, it's, it's amazing to see those pieces still there. And it, that was exactly right. And uh, younger people, means, uh, uh, today's uh, people, uh, don't didn't know. So just move to that neighborhood, and oh, it's open area. So why don't we build a house here? Of course, house is gone because water. Uh, so yeah, well, we should have listened to that little story. So storytelling is a very yeah. important. Yeah. yeah, it's tremendous yeah. wisdom. Sorry. I think the thing with like natural disasters, I mean, like people always think like, oh, well, that just happens to those people, you know, like there's always like this distance from right. the situation. And then all of a sudden you find yourself in a situation as like, you know, how do you how do you kind of recover um, right. from like the guilt of, you know, like you feel a sense of guilt as well. It's like, oh, well, I should have listened to these people when they said that. Um, mm. But yeah, I think it's just um, I think preparation is always a key for anything. Mm. I mean, of course, like these situations are so unpredictable. Anything can happen, you know, like a, a volcano can blow in any direction and mm -hmm. different people can be affected, even though like there might be a demarcation saying like, this is a safe zone. So, I mean, we always have to like prepare ourselves in whatever way, whether it's for an earthquake, a tsunami, you know, a hurricane, like that, that has been like the biggest takeaway from this experience to me. It's like, mm -hmm. I will be the first person to say like, get an emergency kit packed you know like hands mm -hmm. down like you just never know like you just never know mm -hmm. get that to three days of water and some food and so on yeah yeah even just yeah. the basics yeah yeah right just in case right? if yeah. anything happens just run yeah. away for at least three four days yeah, yeah. so just yeah, to... sorry go ahead lovely horn and they really yes, had nice. <laughs> <laughs> so good timing car um, yeah. so I, I was just gonna pivot us a little bit to start talking about sure. some of the ways that design may have um, practically met some of the needs of these events you know any strategies that either of you have seen um you know any challenges that have been faced and overcome in creative ways maybe you guys could share anything that you've seen I think maybe you talk a you talk yeah, a yeah. start with that. So yeah. yes, uh, let me start. Um, a, a, of course, uh, I'm I what I mentioned is uh, like song, or, uh, or those stone pieces um, markers. Uh, it's already designed. Talking about hundred years ago, and uh, over generations. That's a very basic. Uh, uh, a design strategy to uh, carry on the message or information to next generation and so on. And it's kind of uh, built in uh, the, 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 the people who live there or grew up there. And that's a, a fundamental um, uh, strategy we have to take. And problem here is that these days people move and new people move in to that neighborhood and uh, uh, people move out to go to big city and so on, then uh, missing connections. And, and uh, uh, young people who just moved into this neighborhood and start business, for example, and how do they get uh, such um, a knowledge from uh, 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 generations up, and how can we carry on um, those information, critical information, and how can we design that uh, design transferring? That might be uh, uh, we have to think about. Yeah, the knowledge transfer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and how you understand, because it's true, it kind of collapses time in a way, because as Nadia was saying earlier, you don't have to try to, um, you know, you don't have to try to reinvent the wheel, 
so to speak. Mm -hmm. You're already building with this base of knowledge in place. So yeah, Nadia. Yeah, I mean, I, I think for me, I mean, on a side note, I'm also a graphic designer. So like, I've actually done quite a bit of like preparation work leading up to this eruption, you know, like um, designing like hazard maps for like the vulnerable communities, um, giving people a sense of where they are within those like dangerous zones. Um, you know, just like general education, awareness and communication. And I have to say, it's one of the first design projects I've actually worked on that I could see like the results, like real time results, like save people's lives, like help them understand where they are. Like, and I mean, in, in the sense of design, like that is so critical, you know, like whether or not it, it could be posters, it could be videos, it could be yeah. primitive means like stones, as um, Yutaka was saying, like it doesn't matter, but it's really critical for people to get that information, always be yeah. aware of where they are, what their risks and hazards are within that space um, and how they can exit from a situation. Um, and that needs to be repetitive. That needs to be something that people are always aware of that's embedded in their culture from the children right up to the elderly. Um, and I think once, once we're able to maintain that transference of knowledge, um, as you were saying, like that, that's important. I mean, that will change over time, you know, like 50 years from now, it could be holograms. Like we don't know like what means these things are going to take on, but we, I think it's important to balance that like modern technology of getting that information across and also using that primitive, um, that primitive way of doing it as well, you know? So that's, that's, that, I would say that's the biggest thing. Yeah. Piggyback on that, I think uh, education, uh, which means uh, uh, a, a schools and uh, other educational system, talking about kindergarten or, or any other uh, school system, uh, we have to uh, embed the, a, a, that particular regional or local information uh, uh, teaching and also um, a, 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 what I learned from my experience was a community building community is the key. Um, a, or, and if anything happens, it's community and uh, rebuilding community after the disaster is the key. And, uh, because uh, uh, outside people just try to come in and help and. Uh, recovery, whatever, uh, uh, build uh, houses again. That's uh, uh, physically it's possible. However, um, uh, it takes long time and uh, to survive right after the disaster, community and uh, human connection is the most important. Oh, uh, we are missing that person from that family, for example. Where is he? Where is she, for example? And, and then try to help out and, oh, uh, she's in the next village, for example, oh, or oh, oh, my grandma was uh, a, 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 a rescued by somebody else and so on. Those information and uh, uh, get community together is very important. And even digital age, um, uh, even though we rely on uh, those digital information and, and uh, social, uh, network and so on. However, um, a, when disaster or any other situation, uh, serious situation happens, uh, uh, you never know. Maybe we don't have uh, power like I experienced in New York City. Uh, we don't have uh, a cell signal, then we are out. So how do we uh, know that uh, uh, you are surviving, I'm surviving in that moment? So probably education and community, building communities is very important. Yeah, I love where this conversation is going because it feels like at either end of the spectrum, you know, culture mm -hmm. is something that's very individual and personal, but it's also like something that exists, you know, through government and leadership and vision, you know, at the highest level of whatever that country is. I mean, one thing I'd love to note is I really admire Dominica's stance having become and making the decision after Maria, Hurricane Maria, to become the first climate resilient country in the world. I thought that was incredibly courageous. And what they've done is they've tried to solve some of those problems across the board at various 
various levels, yeah? So just to kind of wrap things up or come to a point of takeaways, right? Because, I mean, there's just been tremendous knowledge and experience shared from both of you. And I mean, well, obviously in your other work as well, you know, um, I'm curious what you would say are the key takeaways or action actionable advice for designing resilience in a responsible way? Like, how does that land for you? What would you tell someone who maybe is now emerging from some, an experience like this and trying to rebuild or is just experiencing it as a person? I mean, for me, I would definitely say, you know, reach out, speak to other people who have been through like traumatic events similar to, to what you've gone through. Um, see if you can learn something from them. Also speak to people who haven't been through the events who might be able to offer like an objective eye um, on what they, they might see happening. I mean, for example, I had a friend come here and like ask me like, oh, like, are you okay? And I never thought about the question. I was like, yeah, of course I'm fine. And then I started like actually reflecting like, oh, maybe I'm not okay. Maybe there's something that I'm doing that's obviously showing that on you know, the surface that something is a bit off. So, um, you know, like speak to people, you know, figure out a way forward. Um, but for me, the key takeaway is really that preparation leading up to the event. Um, and as Yutaka said, building community before and after, um, which is really tremendous when, especially when you're in the midst of a um, natural disaster, that community component is really important um, to keep, keep things together. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, it's great. It's great uh, comment. Um, I think uh, again, I, I try to add on to uh, Nadia's comment. I uh, I think uh, uh, it's it's important to uh, a, a start early. Means uh, it's not about uh, a rescue effort after the disaster. Um, a, a, a talk to people. Um, the, so each uh, geographical area has a, some uh, specific issues, right? Could be a hurricane, could be an uh, earthquake, could be um, a flooding. And, uh, but uh, each area uh, has a, some specific uh, a, a problem or issues uh, we have to know, uh, which uh, actually I don't know until I get there. So how to educate or uh, reach out to people in each area and uh, uh, share the information in advance and uh, uh, probably establish uh, some training and uh, knowledge sharing um, a, a campaign, maybe a good idea to start out and uh, then um, uh, it's it, because we cannot uh, go there and uh, sit with them every time or everywhere. So, how to embed knowledge to uh, 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 from all, all generations to current generation? That's what I would uh, suggest to start out. Yeah, and I and I think I mean like the biggest takeaway is trust the experts. Like don't yes. think that, you know, you have to trust the experts. They have been doing research on this stuff. Like they have gone through disaster after disaster. Like it's really important to listen to the information that they're giving to you at the end of the day. You know what I mean? And of course, like I said, there's that indigenous knowledge and community, but at the end of the day, like the experts put, they compile that information into a way um, to keep you safe and protect you ultimately. Yeah. Agreed. Okay, guys. Well, thank you so much for your time today. This was a really rich conversation. I hope it inspires a lot of people. And I have to say, I feel inspired after having this conversation with both of you. So thank you again so much for your time. Thank you. Yes. Thank you both. Thank okay. you for having me.